our training, We Are the World, we are going to move forward with doing introductions now. Hello, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Jaleesa McDuffie. Um, I'm a part of Crittenden Services. I've been working in the social work field for about 10 years now. Um, in regards to uh, how my domino started, um, as you may see, I present as a black woman. However, there's a layer that you don't see. I am queer. So to so some people, that might be a triple threat, but I like to think of it as a triple asset. So. Good afternoon, my name is Karina Mora. I've been in the social work services for about now six years. Um, and one, my domino would be, I was a teenage mom. So uh, I get a lot of looks <laughs> when they find out, oh, I, she has a 16 year old son. Yes, I do, um, but I'm here. So I could relate to our teenage moms um, community. And not just relate to them, she exceeded. She has a master's degree. So when people say teen moms can't do it, they can. My name is Kendra Tankersley Davis. I'm the Vice President of Development and Community Engagement for Crittenden Services for Children and Families. I have worked in the field for, I hate to say it, because in my mind I'm 22, but 18 years. And my daughter's 22, so she says I can't be 22. But in social services, we really don't do math, so it kind of just doesn't I don't do math, it doesn't matter. So we are here today. I also, I don't like the word oversee. I am responsible for our JEDI committee, because we really are, it's a very team-based and teamwork uh, committee within our agency. I'm also a professor at Vanguard University, teaching human trafficking, which also falls a lot into JEDI. So I, we are very honored and happy to be here. So thank you to Penny Lane for choosing us. My domino is, I was sharing with Judy, her, her statement really touched me. Growing up, um, I was always called an Oreo or white or I'm not black enough, but I am black, but I wasn't black enough because I didn't fit the stereotype. And my mom would say, just because I raised my kid to speak correct English, we were not allowed to speak slang. And there are many people in the black world who don't communicate that way. I guess people just fit the stereotype and think that, believe the stereotype and think that we do. So that led me to be open to say everybody matters and I want to see everyone as an individual and not as a group. So that is my domino. Thank you. Our presentation today is we are the world coming together to help heal from hate and judgment. I think we can all agree that we are in some rather difficult times. Things that we thought would have changed and be different somewhat are, but for the most part are not because we see every day and what we read and what we see and what we hear something else negative and very damaging. Birmingham, Alabama, 1963, four girls were killed in a church bombing. The bombing was done by the Ku Klux Klan. This year we celebrated the 60 year anniversary of this tragedy. August 26, 2023, three people killed at the Dollar General store in Jacksonville, Florida. The intent of the bomber was he, and I quote, hated blacks, and I think he hated just about everyone that wasn't white. He made that very clear. It was in his uh, social media post. Orlando, Florida, June 12, 2016, the Pulse nightclub, 49 people killed, 53 injured. According to the person, Omar Mateen, who did this atrocity, his father said, Omar became very angry after seeing two men kissing in Miami months ago. An ex-co-worker told the news he was racist, belligerent, and toxic. Club Q, Colorado Springs, Colorado, November 19th, 2022. Five people killed, 19 injured. It seems to be unsure, and there's various versions as to why this tragedy happened. Some are saying that the person, uh, Anderson, oh, no, the person who did this, I just don't even like saying their names, I'll be honest. I don't like giving them that credit. He wanted to, and I quote, cleanse society. Asian hate crimes, we saw a tremendous increase in Asian Americans and Asian immigrants being um, 
battered, abused, discriminated against. A lot of it, you'll see the sign that says, I am not a virus, was as a result of statements that were made in reference to COVID-19. This, I'll be honest, when I did this research, shocked me. I knew the stories. I didn't know she was a retired social worker. 2019-2020, we had Lena Hernandez, a retired social worker, who was going around doing these rants on Asian people. Uh, October 2019, she verbally attacked a woman at the Delamo Mall, telling her she didn't belong here. She, and that woman filed a police report and nothing was done. It wasn't followed up, it was just like, okay, thank you very much. June 10th, 2020, she verbally attacked a woman who was exercising, and she told her, this is not for you. Get the blank out of this state. Go to whatever country you belong in. June 10, 2020, same day, not much, not even an hour after, she verbally attacked a man who was at the park playing with his children. He was leaving the park, and she, this is my government, go home, I don't understand you Chinamen. You know what, I'm not a racist, but you know you need to go home, go home. Do you know how many people can't stand you being here? You play games, we don't play games. I play games where you get blank to death. Do you know why my family is? Do you know who your family is? Go home to your family. This is my government. Go home. You are getting blank. You are so blank. This is from my country, and this is from my government. Go home. Put that on your Facebook. I was actually going to show the video of her rant, but it was too painful to watch, I'll be honest. Jewish anti-Semitism. A number of different things that are happening within the Jewish community. A student killed a professor because they thought the professor was Jewish. Two people killed leaving a synagogue, anti-defamation leagues. Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, someone was going around putting flyers on homes and businesses with anti-Semitism and hate. El Paso, Texas, August 3rd, 2019, 23 people were killed. Patrick Cruces drove 600 miles to a predominantly Latino community because he said, and I quote, we're having an invasion of immigrants. Disney World, September 3rd, 2023, white supremacists did a protest march and their focus was anti-Semitism and anti-LGBTQ plus population. I had to update my slide last night He's six. His mom opened the door and this man attacked her. Certainly there's mental illness involved, I, I bet. You Muslims must die. He was her landlord. He rented the space to her. But what they said is that his wife said he had become increasingly um, disturbed with the Muslim community. He was increasingly watching more right-winged um, television and news reports, and she felt that that generated and caused him to have this extreme hate. Just because these things are happening, and the point of showing you these slides is that you understand it's not over. A lot of times people feel that we've progressed so far that these things are not impacting us, and they not only impact us, but they impact the kids and the people that we serve. I worked with a transgender client who's transitioning male to female, and he went to a, she went to a store to get a job. It's not a fancy store. I just don't want to say the name of the store, but it's not a fancy store. It's like a, you can buy stuff for very little money there. And she was told, we don't want your kind here. That was six months ago. So these things are happening, but it doesn't mean that it needs to continue to happen. And there are, we want to share with you ways that you can help to heal and restore. Now, I know uh, what we just heard and some of the pictures we just saw was kind of heavy, but I'm coming in with a little hope, so it gets better, okay? A lot, <laughs> a lot of hope, and the work we do matters, and that's what we need to continue to get better. Alrighty, so uh, there is a quote by a writer by the name of Charles Caleb Colton that I would like to read. Um, he stated, we hate some persons because we do not know them and we will not know them because we hate them. Okay, the definition of hate is trying to understand something that you don't understand, you know. 
Um, however, how do we stop hate? It starts with us. The work we do is important again, but it starts with ourselves and understanding our biases, okay? Now, show of hands, who here believes that everyone has biases? Yes, every hand in this room is up, which is, you know, correct, okay? However, how can we unlearn them? How do we know the difference between facts and beliefs, okay? How can we understand new ideas but still have our values? How are we interpreting the media we consume and the clients and the communities we serve? You know, um, I know a lot of us are involved with the current crisis right now, looking, doom scrolling, as some would say, but are we taking time to take care of ourselves? Our beliefs can create our automatic thinking and how we see others in our professional and personal lives. So I will give a quick backstory. Um, I love New York. I've been twice. Uh, I went for the first time when I was 18. However, I love Law & Order SVU as well, okay? <laughs> I got a couple <laughs> fans in the house. Um, of course, I'm an only child as well. What did my mother think when I was traveling to New York with some friends? OMG, I'm going to get sexually assaulted. Something's going to happen. I'm black and I'm queer. Jaleesa, don't go outside. Just take pictures. All this type of, you know, matters, you know? Of course, we are worried, but we still need to live in this world. We still need to navigate different spaces that are maybe always not comfortable. Um, in regards to working with clients, we may encounter some responses or behaviors and be like, did they really just do what I think they did? Or did they really say what I think they did? However, you know, we need to sit with that, but instead we might need to ask, where did they learn that from? Where did they get this idea from? However, everyone is doing life for the first time. That is a quote by my grandmother that I love, okay? Um, so we have to be change agents, okay? We understand that nobody is perfect. You can still be respectful with having your beliefs, but you have to make sure you also have some facts. Okay. All right, how to fact check. I think every agency uh, is doing the work, but it needs to continue. Uh, you need to learn from yourself first. Again, we said it starts with yourself and reflecting on your own judgments and experiences and being genuine. I really wanna stress the word genuine, okay? Of course, this is a one-day conference. The work doesn't stop here. It needs to continue beyond today, beyond that staff meeting, beyond you know this quick huddle with your peers. And everyday folks at the same time, not just the initial conversation. Okay. You also wanna educate yourself with credible, reliable sources and increasing your exposure with folks who may not favor your in-group, okay? Uh, me and Kendra both identify as black women. However, uh, Karina identifies as a Latinx woman, and she's not a part of my in-group. Well, she is. She's my peer. <laughs> she's my peer. But however, um, I kind of make it uh, a job of myself to talk to everyone at our agency. I just don't talk to the black people or the queer people or, you know, people who might have dogs like myself and not, you know, kids, but I talk to everyone. And it's important to talk to everyone because you get shared experiences, you get different perspectives, and that's how you learn. We need to explore different perspectives to educate ourselves and others. Um, I'm not the end all be all of all things black and queer. I'm not the encyclopedia for things black and queer, you know? Uh, you shouldn't ask me, hey, what is this? What is this? Maybe educate yourself first and then come to me with those questions. Okay, um, I have natural hair, which are called locks. I call them locks. They are not dreadlocks because they are not dreadful, okay? <laughs> however, <laughs> however, people come up to me all the time and ask me, hey, Jaleesa, how do you work with this client who maybe has natural hair. And I always redirect them and be like, hey, have you asked the client first? Have you done some research? YouTube is a great place for natural hair, okay? I've done it myself, <laughs> do it myself, okay? However, uh, I might not, again, be the person that knows everything, but I can contribute to a conversation. But however, are we having those conversations to begin with? In addition to how to fact check, you need to be mindful of the media you're consuming. Um, I identify with the group millennials. Any other millennials in the house? I'm the, okay, all right, got a, maybe, yes, maybe. <laughs> uh, might have some Gen X folks in here, maybe some baby boomers in here. However, you need to talk to those different groups as well. 
Um, I'm a millennial again, and I use TikTok pretty often, you know? I get some of my information from TikTok, but I ensure that I fact check it with another reliable source, okay? Also, if you're only viewing things from maybe Fox News or CNN, you might not be getting a full perspective of how others think, okay? So, uh, what you can teach and share, and this is probably one of the biggest takeaways we would like for you guys to take away, is that, again, it starts with you, but are you open? Are you having those conversations at those staff meetings? Are you kind of the black sheep that is like, here she goes again with her Jedi mess, you know? However, you need to be that person, okay? Um, with our domino theme for today, folks also need to continue having conversations which may be difficult, but necessary to move change forward. You need to fact check. You need to share this information in places that have to attempt, the word attempt, to be safe. Psychological safety at work is a big thing that we try to enhance at Crittenton because not all spaces are safe for everyone, okay? Instead of maybe having safe spaces, you need to have culturally brave spaces that require intention, vulnerability, willingness, and respect in forums such as meetings and newsletters. But first, you have to start. You have to be the change you, you want to see, but you also have to be the change that you may be needed. You have to think about how others may feel and remember that intent versus impact. And this is what I would like to leave you guys with. Intent is what you did, impact is who you are. So. So, now I would like to share uh, how at Cranton we do our research and celebrate diversity, diversity, sorry, um, through our, our different um, departments. Uh, foster care, that's currently my department, which I'm happy for. Um, as most foster families agencies, our research parents have to complete a pride training where they learn to care for children of different cultures, faith, lifestyles, and values. So when they come to us, we just don't let them say, oh, this is a child you're getting, deal with it. No, we want them to go through a training where they could be open-minded, accepting, and willing to do, the, to do the research on their own once a child is in their home. Ongoing cultural support and awareness is provided for research parents. So as myself, as social worker, when I do my home visits, I make sure that the child's background is included within the home, not just the child himself or herself, um, that the families are having those conversations or events that the child also wants to be um, keep going on from their background. Um, encouraging and assisting in celebrating the child's culture, faith, values, traditions, and beliefs. So if the child tells me, oh, back in my home country, we celebrated my birthday by doing this, we make sure we have those conversations with the research families to make sure that they incorporate those beliefs, those traditions with the child so the child doesn't feel like an outsider. Should a child be a different culture or faith than a research parent, that the family is provided resources to the faith or culture community of the child and the child is linked to that community. So for example, I know a few months ago, um, there was a Guatemala festival um, in, in the OC area and I had a, a research family who had three boys who had um, their background, they're from Guatemala, so I did mentioned that and at first she was like, oh, well, what do I do? Oh, well, it's a festival, you know? And the next um, home visit she was like, oh, I'm so glad because I took these recipes, now we're baking this, and now we're playing this music. So the research parents actually took the time to be involved and part of, and the child was like, oh yeah, like that made me feel like we were back in Guatemala and the research parents weren't walking around like strangers. Um, we also have the monthly foster care bites which is written in English and Spanish, and every issue has a culture recipe and other important information. The nice thing about the culture recipe, we actually ask a child, like I'll call him or her or um, what, during our home visit, and I'll ask him, oh, it's time for our foster bites. Um, would you like to share a recipe, uh, a plate, a dish, something that you miss or that you wanna share? And yeah, they'll go ahead and share it, put it on the um, newsletter, and we give the opportunity to all of our research parents to learn and bake or just cook that dish with other child 
with their child in their home. What if they're not Guatemalan? Does it mean that they can't try it? They're also just expanding their knowledge for that. In our, our outpatient services, um, they develop interventions and treatment that is specific to the child and family being served. The team works to learn the child and family's cultural traits and beliefs, so we just don't ignore our, um, the family's, the family's um, traditions. We also want them to incorporate their own traditions into the child so they get to learn, not just, okay, I'm here, I'm going to go to school, come home, and that's it. No, we want them to make them feel like they're part of their, their family in their own home. Uh, we work uh, to link the child and family to positive culture experiences, should they be open to it. For s some examples, a case manager assisted a child in getting a, a specific Bible that is essential to his faith. Acquiring funding to pay a child to participate in playing soccer because this game is a large part of his culture. We do have a lot of um, young boys whose soccer, it's everything to them. Some families must say, oh, well, he could just go to the backyard and kick the ball. No, it's more than that. <laughs> you know, it's learning about um, the game and different teams and what it means, and that's how they express themselves. Um, cooking and, um, and the food is often a core part of many families and culture. One of our families had strong ties to their culture traditions involving food. The mother really wanted to pass down culture and family recipes to her children. However, her stove was broken. The Crittenden team working with the family was able to use flex funds to purchase a stove with a working oven for the family. This somewhat small purchase had a large impact. The mother shared that she was able to share her, their family culture, which was brought the family closer together. I'm also going to touch briefly about our unaccompanied minor program, which I have the privilege of being a supervisor of. Um, we currently uh, service children from every continent except for the exception of Antarctica. Um, however, um, I'm learning a lot from the kids. Um, however, I've had to educate myself on a lot of matters that I was not aware of, and I have to tell a quick story um, about my wife, because we just, yeah, my wife, I like saying that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was raised uh, as an adolescent in the South. So I grew up kind of in Georgia, a little bit of Mississippi, Alabama, you get the idea. However, uh, <laughs> I moved to California, uh, back to California when I was a teenager, and I was 16. Of course, my family is originally from here, but I just assumed uh, all brown people were Mexican, okay? My wife is Mexican, however, she quickly corrected me uh, when I called one of her friends Mexican. She was like, no, she's El Salvadorian, okay? However, I do love geography, and I forgot about South America, okay? <laughs> I forgot. Hey, South America is broken up in several countries. Everybody is not Mexican, okay? So I do, I'm very passionate about culture in our program because it's very important to understand the differences in cultures. Uh, Mexicans are way different than El Salvadorians, than Hondurans, than Peruvians, and all the food is amazing. I encourage you guys to eat it, okay? I have gained a lot of weight since being in this program. However, um, our treatment treatment teams, our case managers, supervisors, our therapists emphasize culture. We want to preserve the culture and we want to preserve and have our kids remember, hey, uh, yes, you might be in this new place and have to navigate a new system, but don't forget what made you you. And it's okay to be you. It's actually a good thing to be you and we want to celebrate you. So. Um, our children in our program also get monthly stipends in regards to spending for their culture. So we do give them grocery money to go to African markets or, you know, Latinx markets, or we do try to find restaurants and connect them to folks that maybe look like them or talk their language. Uh, we have a girl from Malaysia, and she got really excited when she uh, ate Burmese food for this the first time. It's not the same, because if anybody knows Malaysian uh, restaurants, let me know. However, it's not the same, but she was so excited and so thrilled, and it reminded her of home, and that's why it's so important. It's not for us, it's for the clients we service. In addition, um, we have an amazing community engagement director and department that locates mentors and volunteers and folks that might speak their language. Currently on our, on our campus, we have 17 different languages aside from English. So we, we really appreciate those who do speak languages, but we have a lot of support from our uh, community engagement department. 
In addition, uh, I also have the privilege, I think this work uh, that we do is a privilege, I have the privilege of creating what's called cultural corners. Not everybody knows how to work with kids who identify as black. Um, also, kids who identify as black versus kids who identify as African American. There is a difference. I don't know what part of Africa I am from, so I consider myself black, whereas I have a friend who's Nigerian, and she considers herself African American. Just to give you guys some context as to maybe some people you know, call themselves this or call themselves that. But the Cultural Corners uh, are striving to educate uh, the folks at Crittenden and the folks that we service on maybe how to work with a child from Venezuela and understanding the trauma and the history and the background that maybe they've encountered. Also right now we are seeing an uptake in our maybe Middle Eastern kids and that is attributed to the crisis. So I have a lot of work to do in regards to educating myself on the Israeli and Palestinian issues. However, I have to do the work myself. It's not up to the kid that comes from Israel or Palestine to educate me, okay? Also, uh, I'm a part of this amazing committee with these ladies called JEDI. So this is a, a acronym that we adopt here at Crittenden. We stand for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, some people might refer to it as DEI. That's also a popular acronym that is referenced. However, these are just some tips that you can do and we do at Crittenden in regards to creating these spaces. So providing ongoing education about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We're always constantly researching. Kendra does an amazing job of keep, keeping us up to date on every matter. Um, providing monthly articles for the agency to educate and support our belief in the benefit and necessity for diversity, inclusion, and justice for all. And providing responses for tragic events and social issues that impact our staff, agency, and clients. Um, at the beginning of the session in this room, I really liked, uh, I believe it was Miss, Miss Wendy, yes, she said it, how we need to check in on each other. We just need to simply ask, are you okay? Um, regardless if you identify or resonate with that issue or not, just being human first, um, aside from culture. Some other tips would be provide a safe space for staff to share painful experiences that they, their family, friends, or clients may have experienced and provide support. It's important to hear those stories too, just to understand where they're coming from or why they're feeling some type of way. Advocate for those who are often unheard and unseen. Sometimes they just might be scared or shy to speak up. So if we could be the voice for others, why not? And also simply to care. I mean, we're a team. We need to care for each other. You guys should know I am a total crybaby. I don't know, after I gave birth 22 years ago, I just cry all the time. But I just saw the full story about that six-year-old last night. And it, I just couldn't believe it. I, my brain couldn't wrap around it. You know, you think you've seen everything working in this field, and then it surprises you. The thing we like to say is there is so much hope and goodness in the world. Like there really truly is. When we see a tragedy, you see people come together and we stand together. We also need to do that before the tragedy starts. We've got to be preventative and it's something we can do. When putting this together, this is my favorite. This is a Latino beautiful community. And they're saying, in Spanish, we stand to support Black Lives Matter. It doesn't matter. They're just there to say, hey, we don't want people to be mistreated. We're standing with you. Whether you support the organization or not, we're just standing together. And I think that's one of the things that's so vitally important for us at Crittenton is we stand with each other. And I think we do that well. We really do. I'm going to give us a little pat on the back. When we create safe spaces, we really try to. We, um, we would do these little groups. We would just establish times in the agency where staff could call in and one of the JEDI members would just be on Zoom and they could chime in if they wanted to and share. And one of the people that came in on one of my sessions, she shared about being fat shamed. And I just, I absolutely couldn't believe what she told me. She was there as a parent partner to help a caregiver going through a challenge and every time, every week they go to meet, the caregiver would have healthy snacks and say, let's go walk. And she realized what she was doing. And that was hurtful 
that's painful because she's comfortable with who she is. She's a beautiful woman. And eventually, she did it. We, she, she was asked if she'd like to be removed from that case, and she said no because I'm going to show her something. I'm going to show her myself as a human, as a person. And by the end of her working with that family, the lady cried. She didn't want her to leave because she had helped her so much. We've all experienced it. I had a person tell me she didn't want me in her house, and I couldn't figure out why because I was just there to supervise the team. And my boss at the time, who was Indian, she goes, it's, it's something you can't change. And I'm like, what? My hair color? I do change it. <laughs> like, I don't know how because I'm gray. And then and this hides it better. And she's like, no, it's the color of your skin. I can't change that, nor do I want to. But we've all experienced that. So how do you show up for those that you work with when they go through something? Do you as an individual, as a supervisor, as a colleague, do you create a safe space for them to share? My boss created a safe space. Or things that happen to them out in the world, do you create a safe space? And that's really important. We firmly believe that we are the difference. We know, I saw your beautiful stack of dominoes. When one tipped, they all fell. It only takes one. Are you the light for your agency? Are you that one that reflects that you see people as an individual? That you see people for who they are and not what you believe them to be? Are you opening the doors so you can be asked questions? I firmly believe in being accountable. One of my best moments and most embarrassing in my life. Um, I always thought I was a very non-biased person, Jalissa, because of how I grew up. And never, you know, love everybody. That was my mom. And um, I w this was like 25 years ago. I was working somewhere, and I was in my office, and there was a woman who would walk by and say hi all the time. She worked in a different department, and she was lesbian. And I would, she would talk to me, and I liked talking to her, but I was like, is she trying to get with me? Like, I don't know. And I had had friends, but they were gay male friends. So I was like, what if she's trying to get with me? I, I'm straight. I don't know what to do. And I think she felt my apprehension. And she said to me one day, and to, we're friends to this day, and she says to me, what's wrong with you? And I was like, well... Nothing. And she goes, no, stop being proper. What's wrong with you? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm straight. She says, I know your boyfriend is, because he would come to the office. And she said to me, do you have a type? I said, I do. And she said, what is it? I said, tall, he needs to be smart. La, la, la. And she goes, well, that's not who you're dating. And I was like, she's right. <laughs> oh, she was right. Though. She was. And God bless me, I ended up marrying him and divorcing him. Um, soon after. But she says, you know something, you're cute and all, but I got a type and it ain't you. And that's just how she said it to me. And I was like, what? Her willingness to be open towards my ignorance changed me. We literally are friends to this day. I can't even be, when I think about it, and I've thought about this, all of my friends who have the longest marriages, they actually are lesbians. They've been, no, but they're not divorced. All my other friends, all the straight friends, we all been divorced and remarried. But, uh, I know. But she opened herself to teach me in a quick sentence. She ignored my ignorance. She did make me feel stupid. But I loved the fact that she made me feel ignorant and that she said, let me educate you. And it was the best thing that has ever happened to me. One of the best, because I just love her. We just have a beautiful friendship. And her wife is nothing like me. So that's true. One of the things we wanted to provide you with is some takeaways, some things that you can take with you that may support you in your journey. So this is just some, some short re tips on things that we do at our agency. This is a poem that was recently written about the unrest um, and how we can bring peace. And we believe we can bring peace through kindness and simple acts of kindness. These are some resources that you can utilize as well as our contact information. We also brought a few copies of our Jedi Cultural Corner. 
you feel free to take a look at it. It has just different things, like one is how ice cream is made across the world. It can go very simple or it can go very differently. This is another one. It was National Happiness Month, and Jalissa wrote about various ways people express or share happiness in different countries. This is our foster care bite, which comes in English and Spanish, and it goes to all of our resource families throughout the agency. I also try to have it posted on our website, and I love to read it because it also will give these really fun cultural recipes. Um, I just think it's important to open ourselves up to learn. They all, when Jalissa said, like, Karina's not in our group, I was like, no, Karina, you're in my group, because Mexican food is my favorite all day, every single day of my life. She knows, everybody knows that about me. How did that come? When I was a little girl, Miss Saldana introduced me to Mexican food. So open yourselves up to learn and express, because let me tell you, you can put anything in a tortilla and it's delicious. I just want to tell you that. It doesn't matter what it is. And bolillos, I can eat a lot of them. They're delicious. So we would like to do a little engagement exercise with you guys. One simple act of kindness that you can do as an individual that will bring peace. Raise your hand, tell us something, and you will get a wonderful Crittenton cool surprise. It's like a gift. Go. The question is, what is one simple act of kindness that you can do that will generate peace? Showing up with curiosity. Oh. Yes. Showing up with curiosity. Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Because it eliminates um, making assumptions about people. It, creates connection because you are eliciting information, wanting to connect and know more about the other person. Yes. I love learning about people. Oh, all of you have cute flowers. You guys are very fabulous. <laughs> Who else? Simple act of kindness. Well, we're... This on? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm a firm believer that Peace worldwide starts inside. And uh, in terms of an act of kindness is to, you know, make people feel welcome. You know, hi, how are you? And to pay attention to maybe the one in the group that feels a little withdrawn yes. to make sure that you've acknowledged and that person and to make them feel welcome. Yes see each other. We need to see each other. Anyone else? This side of the room's been quiet and I deliberately gave you chocolate to get out the food coma of lunch. Somebody, a simple act of kindness that can generate peace. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Anything else, anyone else? A simple act of kindness that can generate peace. Yes, yes. And just saying hi. My mom's from the South, but I'm from here, but I went to New Orleans and to visit. It's a very fun place. And I swear to you, everywhere I went, hi, hey, how y'all doing? Hey, and they don't know me. I was like, what? And my mom's like, in the South, we acknowledge each other. I don't need to know you, but I need to see you. That was her thing with us. An act of kindness is doing, doing for others. Um, okay. For instance, oh. if a neighbor needs help, but something as simple as rolling out the trash cans or watching their dog, or, um, you know, I had a neighbor, an older, elderly neighbor who needed to be taken to the hospital, and it was an emergency, but just extending yourself out. But can I say something else on the, on the high thing? I've noticed that, I don't know if it's a cultural, if it's an area, uh, parts of the country, I have family in Ohio. And um, whenever I go, for run, I go out, and I love to go out to run in the morning, and I go out to run, and you see people here in California, and you wave, and people wave back at you by, for the most part, and they smile. Um, in Ohio, 
I don't know if it was just that particular community I was in, but it was very, I felt sad, I guess, because I wasn't getting that positive feedback. I would smile and say hi to people, and it was just kind of like, like, oh, this person's not from here. <laughs> but you know what? I challenge you to find someone from there and ask them why, because I did that once. I will do that. Because you will learn something. Part of the, one of the things I do in the resources that we gave, Crittenton participates in the Department of Mental Health, LA County Clergy Roundtable. I encourage you all to do it. I've learned so much um, from that. It's different clergy, different faiths, and different mental health. And I was raised Catholic. I now attend a non-denominational Christian church. But I remember saying, I'm a former Catholic. And the priest said, no, you're not. You're a non-practicing Catholic. And I said, thank you, Father, for the correction, because I know better. I know my family. But I had said, you know, I go to this store, and there's a lot of Muslim women there. And I say hi, and they don't speak. Is it that they can't speak to me? And it was a Muslim um, person there, clergy. She wasn't like a pastor. She was a, some type of clergy not like the head person. And she goes, no, they're just rude. That's just, and I was like, thank you. And she educated me, no, they're just being rude. Little did I know, two years later, my daughter's best friends in high school would be a beautiful Muslim family and we're great friends. And they, those particular people were just being rude. It wasn't the all, it was just them that I was running into. So that's why I say ask. I challenge you to find someone from that community and ask them. Someone here, yes. I was just thinking of the song to McGraw, Be Humble and Kind, and when I worked with my autism, we always would sing that song for karaoke, and I would always remind them to always be humble and kind, because those the lyrics in that song are beautiful. very powerful. And beautiful. What if we played that in our offices on like the speakers, instead of somebody's gone crazy and run? What if we played that? <laughs> And then my, my biggest song that I came from um, working at an autism program was our song was Don't You Worry by Black Eyed Peas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Like, I think music, music and food can connect people very quickly. Um, I would say, I would say listening. Um, my neighbor just recently got diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and she lives by herself. So I take the time to go check in on her and just sit um, and listen you know, and uh, she's so appreciative of it. Mm -hmm. But she's such a kind woman, um, so that's my way of showing her I see you, I'm here, um, and I care. That is so beautiful. If we see each other, then how can we judge each other? If I see you as a person, as an individual, if I see something about you, I'm gonna find something that connects us. How can I judge you? All of those people in the slides before, they didn't take the time to learn about anyone. They didn't take the time to learn about any of those people that they harmed. They just judged and made assumptions based off myths. Who knows where they got it from? So I, I challenge you, see each other, see people, see our beautiful differences and our amazing likenesses share who you are with people. Let them see you. They always tell me I love everybody. I really do. I really don't care what you look like, who you are, what you, tell me what's your core? What's about you? When we get new staff, I try, hey, how are you? Like, I wanna meet you, I wanna know about you. When each of you do trainings or staff meetings, do you do icebreakers to find something? Mine is usually about food. I'm not gonna lie. And I will tell that I go around, what is, what's your favorite food, what's your favorite food? And if it's not Mexican, they're kinda out. I do tell them, you're out. <laughs> and they find that funny, right? And that I know my, I know pozole, I wish I had some now. Like I know different foods, I'm very into my Mexican food. And it surprises people, but it also bridges a connection with people. Because maybe they wouldn't think that of me. Southern food's good too, my mom's from the South, but both my mother and I both like Mexican food better. So how, what are our differences? What are our likenesses? How do we break stereotypes? What do you share about yourself? I had a family of beautiful Mexican sisters and they only thought white people went to college. Nobody on their rap team was white. And then they said, and their sister had just finished UCI, that was a fluke. 
And they said, what's your last name? I said, Tankersley, and they were like, we already know. Somebody in your family's white, that's why you went to college. Now I went to college because my mom will kill you if you don't. It's a whole different thing. But that was their belief system. We had to help them change it by using ourselves. So please open yourself to do that because you will be amazed at the connection you bring, at the kindness you show, and at the peace that will trickle down from you to the next, to the next, to the next. And that's how we stop this ugliness, unified through peace. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, on one of the slides that you showed the recent hate crime with the six-year-old, you mentioned uh, the landlord, there, there'll be a, 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 some mental health with it. How do you suggest that we deal with, we're offering support for mental health, but where is a line that we draw where mental health can't be an excuse for a hate crime? That's such a hard question. It's really my assumption after watching it, my husband, second husband, right husband, is, the, is a news junkie. And so when he watched it, I thought, did he just snap? Because he rented the place to them. And if you were had that kind of hatred and bias, you wouldn't have. So I just thought, and working in mental health so long, but I think there does need to be a line. I mean, he knocked on the woman, the woman was having dinner with her beautiful son, and he just started fighting with her, and the, they're saying, the woman was saying, but we wanna be peaceful. We wanna be peaceful, and he just, he stabbed that little boy 27 times, and the mom 12. So in your right mind, would you do that? Is he being poisoned by whatever it was he was listening to? We don't know, but I think a line at some point um, does have to be drawn. We, we do see tremendous mental health issues that are going on, tremendous. But hate is like raised and festered, I taught, I think. Um, and when you're not open to being something different, learning something different. When my friend, when Terry said to me I wasn't her type, I could have been, oh, well, but I was open to it. So it's such a hard, complex question to answer. Do you guys have, yeah, I have a, um, Just a small addition to that. I mean, mental health is important, but um, having that difficult conversation with the person that's maybe exhibiting the behavior, on our residential campus, we were catering to some boys from Afghanistan. And my father's a Marine, so he was like, Jay, uh, the connotation of Americans in Afghanistan is not probably positive. That's probably why they're exhibiting those behaviors. So he would call me monkey. Very rough to deal with. You know, I had to take a couple parking lot walks sometimes. So of course, it progressed. Our relationship, you know, had a lot of complexities, but it advanced to Miss Monkey. Okay, I got a little respect. It's still a derogatory, <laughs> derogatory term, however, respect. And then it got to my name. And then when it got to my name, I simply asked him, hey, a couple weeks ago when you called me that name, where did you get it from? And he was like, oh, in my country, that's what we call you guys, because we have a negative connotation with Africa. And I was like, well, I'm technically kind of from Compton, so don't call me no more. Don't call me that no more, okay? But having that difficult conversation, and now he knows that here in America, in Compton, in Los Angeles, uh, monkey doesn't go over so well with some people. So educating people, but having those difficult conversations, but giving yourself a pat on the back when you're like, whew, I made it, I did it. I maybe changed your perspective, so. Thank you all so much for attending our session. We so appreciate it, and we hope that we've inspired you to do small acts of kindness, to bring a little bit of peace which will bring a lot of peace and a lot of change. Thank you for your attendance.